Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corkin here, the host of this show. And every week I get to talk to interesting CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of a range of companies. Go check out the archives. We've got some great episodes back there with the founders or entrepreneurs from EO, Kinko's, Netflix, Activation Blizzard, uh, YPO, LendingTree, OpenTable, so many more. I'm also the co-founder of Rise25, where we help to connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. A big shout out to our good friend, Kate Ledun at Brandwise Media. Check out Brandwise Media. She introduced us to today's guest, who is Jeff Goldscher. And Jeff has been an advertising and marketing professional since 1993, working on behalf of global brands, including, you've heard a few of these, Comcast, Microsoft, Choice Hotels, Target Corporation, the National Football League. We're going to have a fun story in a second about how he got started, and it has something to do with the NFL. He started and built three different businesses, including an advertising agency and a sports marketing agency, both named multiple times to the Inc. 5000 and was a state finalist in an Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. And since 2014, Jeff has been helping other business owners do the same by supplying fractional CMO services through JK Squared. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that is exactly. He currently works with clients ranging from home improvement to financial services to real estate and hospitality. And of course, this episode is brought to you by Rise25 Media, where we help B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with Done For You Podcasts and content marketing. If you have any questions or if you're curious about how to do a podcast and to do it for your business, give us a call or shoot us an email, support at rise25media.com. All right, Jeff, such a pleasure to have you here today. And you've got this fun pre-internet story that's just going to blow the mind of every millennial that's listening to this right now because they're not going to even relate. But one of your first jobs this is how you got into advertising in the first place. You get a job and you are assigned because there's no Amazon at the time. We need 100 footballs and we need you to get them stat by tomorrow. And, and that's basically how you broke into the advertising industry. Uh, so tell us the story. Yeah, it's great, John. It's um, it's one of these things you wouldn't believe in unless it happened to you. Um, but I'm interviewing for jobs. I really wanted to be a sports reporter when I grew up. That was my dream. And I worked at a, at a paper in Colorado for about three months um, in my junior year in college, and I hated it. So I came back you, that summer to But you studied Baltimore. journalism in college, so that must have I been did. a little – were you distraught? Like, is that blowing your dream? There is, there is nothing like realizing you've spent your entire life preparing for a moment and you're six months from graduating and that's not what you want to do with the rest of your life. That's, that's brutal. What, what, what was it about it that you didn't like? Um, it became a job. So you think about the things that you love to do as a hobby um, and the reality of being a sports writer and working every night and um, being on deadline all the time and having to talk to people you don't know. And um, there were all of these things that were just really challenging. Um, and I think the biggest thing was just, you know, after about the third or fourth time you're covering a baseball game and you're starting to realize that, you know, you got to keep score. You got to pay attention. You can't go get a beer in the middle of the game. You know, you're, you're yeah. working. Yeah. Um, and, it, and, and I lost a lot of my, what I thought would be really exciting. And it actually comes back even later in my career as well. But um, while I'm a huge sports fan, I learned that working in sports isn't necessarily what I wanted to do. And, and did so, you do you covering like a small uh, AAA farm team oh, or no. something? Or no, no, I was called a, a, a little team called the Colorado Rockies. Okay, well, at least um, you're you're in the major there. leagues. Well, this was great. So I, I'm in Boulder, Colorado. Totally non sequitur here, but I'm in Boulder, Colorado. It's my newspaper internship. I have uh, the the Broncos had just hired Wade Phillips as their head coach. I covered the press conference. The Nuggets and the Avalanche were both in the playoffs. I covered playoff games, and the Rockies were having their inaugural season. So I covered the first week of the Rockies and um, met lots of, of established sportsers. I met Rick Riley, who was a big hero of mine at the time, um, you know, talked to all of these guys. And, and again, like I realized being a sports reporter means 
you sleep till noon every day because you've been working to deadline until 1 a.m. Um, your friends are all out doing social things that you're not doing. And uh, the path to being a journalist, it's a difficult path even then. I mean, you're going city to city looking for opportunities. It was going to be a hard road. And yeah. um, and that was, you know, we're talking a period of time when the, then journalism was experiencing a tr or about to experience a tremendous amount of upheaval, too. Exactly, exactly. And it's interesting, like some of the people that I went to college with, um, Mike Greenberg, um, who went on to some great things, Rachel Nichols, who went on to some great things. Um, uh, Michael Wilbon's not that much older than I am. He, you know, these were all I went to Northwestern. I wanted to be Michael Wilbon when I grew up. Mm. And, uh, and it's funny when you when you have that opportunity to get up on the stage and you realize, um, I guess it was my first opportunity to realize sometimes what you think you want isn't exactly what you want. And how do you take that experience and pivot? And there are things that I learned in journalism school and relationships that I built that have really benefited me from a career standpoint. Um, but I knew right away that being a reporter wasn't really what I was cut out to do. Mm. So I kind of interrupted so, you, but to, to, no, the, to, the, to the football story. Yeah. So, so luckily I came out of that. I had an interview at an ad agency for an internship for the summer. I think I went in on a Monday to interview, didn't hear anything back Wednesday afternoon. I'm painting my, uh, my old bedroom in my parents' house and the phone rings um, the house phone. Of course, uh, my mother yells, you know, there's somebody on the phone for you. I run downstairs and uh, it's the person I interviewed with. And he said to me, how quickly can you be at our office in downtown Baltimore with a car big enough to hold a hundred footballs? It was about three o'clock in the afternoon. I said, I'll be there by 3.30. He said, great. I show up at the office. The agency was working on a project for the Baltimore NFL Expansion Committee. And they needed 100 official NFL uh, Wilson footballs, the Duke, they call it. So um, this, is, were, this is before the Ravens. So the Baltimore doesn't correct. have an NFL team. Way before Baltimore hadn't had a team. They've been trying to get an expansion team. They were competing against uh, St. Louis, Jacksonville, Carolina. Um, there were two other teams. Um, Carolina and Jacksonville ended up getting the teams. Um, but we had to go and, and, and they needed these footballs. And again, like you said, this was before Amazon. So they had a deal worked out with Wilson. Wilson was supposed to ship them 100 footballs that were going to be signed the following day. And the footballs didn't show up. So they called me up and they gave me, they had an, an admin calling sporting goods stores around Baltimore. You know, one store had three footballs, one store had five footballs, somebody else had 10 footballs, somebody had two footballs. And so I literally got in the car. Um, the, the, the guy that I was going to be working for gave me his credit card and his cell phone. Because again, this was 1993. Who had cell phones? He had a cell phone. A ball, only um, ballers he, had had uh, cell phones at that time. Yeah, and, and, and he gave it to this kid that he had met briefly, you know, two <laughs> days before, um, and basically just said, "Go." And, and also, and it's so, not like you can call and check in at any point during this journey because it's like six hours. You're out on your own unless you use a payphone or something. I'm my my first. My father's in the printing business. Um, my first stop was actually to my father's office to sit down with his sales guys to go, here's where I need to go. Help me map this out around the beltway. Oh, that was probably smart. And yeah. it was, it worked out great. I remember I, I got to one Modell sporting goods store. They had 20 footballs. I thought I had hit the mother load. It was the greatest. <laughs> um, and I drove around store to store. I think I drove probably 60 miles around the beltway. It took me all of six hours to get all of the footballs. I think the last ones, I ended up back at the office that evening with 107 footballs. Luckily, my mother had a minivan, so they all fit. <laughs> and, uh, and I said to the guy after I dropped off the balls, I said, so does this mean I have the job? He goes, I don't know. Come back tomorrow. We'll see how it works out. <laughs> so I spent the next day handing the footballs to Johnny Unitas and Art Donovan and Lenny Moore wow. and a bunch of other Baltimore cult legends yeah. um, and, uh, and got the football signed. And we used these in a direct mailbox that went out to corporations around the Baltimore area trying to raise money for uh, skyboxes. So the idea, the concept behind it was you give us your autograph and we'll give you theirs. So we sent the footballs in a nice box. The box actually was so successful in driving deposits that we won the Diamond Echo Award that year, which is the award the Direct Marketing Association gives out to the campaign with the highest ROI of any campaign in the country. 
Hmm. And, you know, we generated, uh, you know, several hundreds of millions of dollars in skybox deposits out of this wow. campaign. Our, our, our ROI was off the chart. I got introduced to the wonderful world of advertising, what it really takes to make it. And, um, you know, and I got the internship and that turned into my first job. So I guess it all worked out at the end. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So, and what's, it's kind of interesting. We're going to circle back to this as you found a way to indulge in that passion for sports a little bit later in your career, but let's, let's flash forward to have it advertising. This is your advertising agency, which after a number of years of working for different agencies, you were able to start your own. Uh, but it's an interesting cautionary tale in over-concentration in one industry, because you know, you were really heavily invested. Your clients were all in the cable industry and there was a consolidation that happened in 2009, 2010 during the financial meltdown. Talk a little bit about how that yeah. impacted you. Yeah. So um, I'd always dreamed of starting an advertising agency. Um, I had an opportunity where a client from Comcast called me up and said, hey, we, we want to do a campaign. You want to start an agency, we'll be your first client. This was 2004. So I started the campaign and um, it was successful. And, and that client introduced me to other clients. Um, and we became so successful doing this that he ended up leaving Comcast and coming to be my partner. And we built up this agency based around our expertise in the cable industry. So we would go in and we would sell direct mail, billboards, television campaigns. Every month there was a new campaign that was needed. So it's like getting people to sign up to, you know, have Comcast as their cable Correct. provider. Okay. Correct. And it was, and it was during a period where um, Verizon and the fiber optic people were getting into the marketplace. Uh, Direct TV was getting into the marketplace and, and, you know, it was, it was, uh, they were spending a lot of money on marketing and it was, it was a, a cash cow. I mean, it was a great business model. Um, cause, cause for you for a while, you're, you, you kind of had like a, a system that worked and you would deploy it in one market and then put it in other markets as well. Right. Well, that was exactly it. We called it the have it hybrid system. And essentially we built up this thing where you pick the campaign that you want. We customize it with your offer. We take your database. It was a flat fee, you know, it was 12 cents a piece, no matter how many pieces you wanted to mail. And we really built this whole model around it. And what was interesting was we then hired creative people that could execute against that model. We hired account people that understood the cable industry and we found it really difficult to diversify. So while we picked up other clients along the way, most of them were essentially clients that we could replicate a similar model for. Um, we ended up doing actually a lot of uh, sports marketing for Comcast because every market they would co-brand themselves with a sports team. Um, so Baltimore would do a campaign with the Orioles, sign up for Comcast, get two free tickets for an Orioles game. So we took that model and we were able to use that with other people that were partnering with uh, sports franchises. Um, but ultimately, we built up a nice business. We made the Inc. 5000 twice. We were nominated for all sorts of, of awards. Um, we diverse, the, the extent of the diversification that was really successful for us was because we knew the cable operators. We were able to talk to the cable networks. So we got to do some really interesting creative pieces for Breaking Bad and for Mad Men when they were just trying to get some exposure to the cable operators to get coverage and, and to get support behind those shows. And, uh, and it was great. Uh, 2009, uh, we have the financial meltdown. Um, there's pressure across corporate America to consolidate costs. And somebody at Comcast realizes, hey, wait a second, there's all these little agencies out there doing this work for all of these markets all around the country. We'd really save a ton of money if we consolidated all of them out of Philadelphia, hired one big agency to do all of the work, and centralized all the production on our end. And within three months, 90% uh, of our revenue was gone. Wow. And what was and that we were, like? Did, did you get a call, a phone call? How did it play out? It was, it was probably a series of phone calls. The first call we got was from corporate asking us for a lot of information because they were in the process of consolidating production. So we knew that, you know, we had really done a good job working with different vendors, uh, different partners to really reduce our costs, which we could then pass along to our clients. Our clients had fixed budgets, um, but the production was a big piece of where we drove our revenue from. So we knew that was going away. Then we got a call from corporate essentially saying, hey, we're going to consolidate at the regional level. 
And so our focus went from, you know, Baltimore, Washington, Philadelphia to the Eastern region. And so now instead of having 50 opportunities, we had 12 opportunities. And then we realized very quickly that, wait a second, they're, they're continuing to consolidate, continuing to consolidate. So it really took a couple of months for us to really see it. Nobody ever called us up and said, sorry, you guys are out. Um, we really had to sort of piece the story together, mostly through our contacts on the inside who could help us explain what was driving a lot of these decisions. God, it and frankly, so nerve wracking. It was, it, we had, we had uh, 25 people. We cut back to 10 people. Um, and literally my partner and I were sitting around a, a conference room table, realizing that in order to make this business successful, we were going to have to strip it down to the bones mm -hmm. um, and let everybody go and go back to essentially a freelance model for creative, um, find new clients and really, really hustle our way through it. And, uh, you know, it definitely, uh, taught me firsthand this is what happens when you have uh, aren't properly diversified yeah um, and it's frankly a lesson as a business owner that i've had to learn and relearn and relearn because i think no matter what you do you always sort of feel like i've got this gravy train let me ride it as long as possible yeah um, people are hiring me for this one thing let me do more of that one thing um, and even and even as a as a fractional cmo the last several years there have been times when i've had to check myself and say hey wait a second I'm too consolidated in one industry or I have one client that's taking too much of my time. Um, and I don't want to be that dependent on any one client because you really do leave your entire business vulnerable for when the market shifts and you're not ready to, to handle it. And so in retrospect, if you look back on it now, is there anything that you would have done differently to diversify yourself to prevent that from happening? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that I would have made much more of an effort. Uh, I wouldn't have grown at, at the pace that we grew without really thinking through how we're growing. So we kept adding clients. I kept hiring people. We kept adding clients. I kept hiring people. And then as your business grows, you want to enjoy the success of that business. I bought a house. Um, we went on nice vacations. Um, I made investments. I invested in another agency. Um, and so you start to spread yourself really thin with this idea that, oh, okay, as long as I can just get one more year like the year I just had, and you just don't know when that one year is going to be. So I think looking back on it, um, you know, rather than taking on all of the additional cable revenue, probably finding um, a real new business generating uh, system to go find some other clients, hiring people that I could, knew could do more than focus on the one industry that we were already strong. Um, keeping my overhead low, I think is something that I've learned over time um, because that gives you more flexibility as a business to make the right choices for the business, not the right choices based on your um, lifestyle. Um, those are all things I think that I've done differently as, as I've uh, gotten the experience and having been through it. And now there are often things that I can appreciate with my clients because I understand the ebbs and flows of a business. I know how businesses have been built and I can relate my own experiences as a, as a business leader. Um, even though now they're hiring me just for the marketing, um, there is that carryover effect into just what I learned as a business. Right, right. Now, around the time or shortly before the financial meltdown, you had started another agency, Aquarius Sports and Entertainment, and you ended up splitting that off and you and your business partner kind of go separate ways. Correct, correct. We, we had started, uh, a friend of mine had some experience in the sports agency world and he wanted to start his own sports marketing firm. Um, he was going to take on some outside investors and, and end up holding a very small share. And I said, that's silly. Let us help fund it. So my partner at Habit and I became the co-founders of Aquarius Sports and Entertainment. And um, in, in some ways, it ended up being a nice lifeboat because when we decided that Habit was not going to be able to support both of us, I ended up taking his stake in Habit in, in Aquarius. He took my stake in Habit. He rebuilt Habit from scratch. And in fact, um, I just hired them about a year ago to do a campaign for one of my clients. Hmm. So the world does come full circle. I always tell people, don't burn bridges. You never know where they're going to end up. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I got invested in in Aquarius Sports and Entertainment, and we built a sports marketing agency. And so we got to really repeat uh, the same process of building something from the ground up um, and, and doing it again. And so you're circling back to your original love, sports, but in a different capacity. And so yeah. talk a little bit about what sorts of projects you did. I assume you're a little oh. bit more 
uh, long in the years at this point. So you're not running around Baltimore with a minivan collecting uh, <laughs> footballs this time around. No, no. Instead, I'm running around uh, racetracks in golf carts, um, restocking materials for Target. So um, I never, I've never seemed to get that far from being in a car. I don't know how it happens. <laughs> um, but we did, we did some really neat work. Um, you know, my partner would negotiate the deals. My job was to be the creative uh, person, the marketer, and figure out how to execute them. So here are the assets that we get what do we do with them and so we started and when you say assets loving- that you know you were doing things like video displays and scoreboards and things like that right yes okay. yes so so typically the way it works is you know AAA wants to be a partner with the baltimore ravens because they feel like it'll be a good way for them to connect with new people that'll become AAA members um and the ravens say great we'll give you a scoreboard ad we'll give you a radio commercial and we'll give you um, a suite at the game And we come back and say, that's not what we want at all. What we want are ways to actually engage with people. So here here is, you know, we want a dedicated area that we can use specifically for AAA card holders before the game, a special tailgate zone. We want access to your database of season ticket holders so we can send them out special communications. And where my partner was really strong was being able to go in and negotiate and get the assets that we wanted for our clients. Um, And then I got to bring them to life. And so, you know, I talked about some of the co-marketing work that I did with Comcast and sports teams. We really got to apply it here as well. So we did work with Pulte Homes. We did work with uh, AAA was a big client of ours. Um, And the most interesting thing, frankly, was was we got involved with Target. Um, My partner uh, knew someone uh, who ended up going to work for Target, running their events uh, business. At the time, Target was heavily invested in NASCAR. And um, they came to us and said, we want to promote grocery. And we want to use our NASCAR assets to do that. What do you think we should do? And we came up with three or four ideas, um, which became Taste of Target. And so we took food trucks, we outfitted them um, with Target graphics. We drove them to campgrounds around NASCAR events and gave out free samples of food. If you can imagine, it was extremely popular. I would think so. Um, People loved lining up for the food. In fact, Target, Target hates lines. And so one of the big critiques that we often got was the lines are too long. Um, For the free what do we food. Do? For free food. <laughs> yeah. And so we literally would hire brand ambassadors to, to give out food to people standing in line waiting so that we could keep things moving. Um, we developed a series of uh, shuttles that we ran from the campgrounds to the local Target stores. So increased store traffic that way. We did couponing, which helped build long t- a long tail effect. Um, and it was really neat. Target loved the campaign. Um, we actually did some great videos um, that are on my YouTube page. Uh, and... Um, it was so successful that they ended up recommending us to their partners. So we did a promotion for Banana Boat. We did a promotion for Hershey. We did a promotion for Dove for Men. But all of these other partners of Targets that they wanted to exposure on the car all of a sudden had this agency at their, at their disposal to build these interactive campaigns. And I think that kind of engagement was, was, was awesome. I mean, it was really neat to watch people and, and to get so much of what we do in marketing um, is passive. I put something out there and I hope people will respond. Um, it's really neat when you get to do something that puts you right in front of people where the people in the campgrounds knew us by name and wanted to know what we were sampling today because we had been there for a week. Um, we got to build relationships with the drivers and the race teams in a way that was really uh, unique. Um, and I, I really have a question. Was there any um, anytime you came up with some wild idea that a sports team said, no, 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 that's that's over the line. We're, we're not going to do that. Um, I don't think so. I think more often than not, it was it was where like they weren't comfortable with the assets. So, for instance, you know, if a uh, the the Baltimore Ravens have a, a, a water partnership with Dasani. Um, they're a Coke sponsor. So we wanted to give out water bottles in the parking lots with our logo on it. And they said, you can't do that because that's competing. Mm. Um, but I don't think we ever came up with anything. We did the, the craziest thing I think we ever came up with. Um, Target was doing a partnership with P3. Um, P3 is a product. I think it's by Oscar Meyer, but it's a, it's a protein pack. Um, and so we set up and we were going to do an obstacle course. And people were going to go, we were calling it the P3 obstacle course. And you go through the obstacle course and we were going to win prizes. And um, the lawyers shut that one down. There were all sorts of liability issues running people through an obstacle course at an event. Um, They're drinking, there's, there's, you know, lack of safety. We're hiring a bunch of, you know, 20 year olds to run this thing. They said, that's that's not going to fly. But, you know, the, 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 
I think one of the most fun ideas that we pitched was uh, for snuggle fabric softener and all laundry detergent. Mm -hmm. We ended up setting up a laundry machine pit stop. And so people could come to us, drop off their laundry. We would do their laundry for them and return it to them on a custom golf cart the next day in the parking lots. Was this in association with some sporting event or? It was, this was, this was with Target. We did it at, uh, at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. We did it at uh, Homestead Speedway in Miami uh, around a race because people go and they'll camp out for a week and they've got, they got to do their laundry. Yeah. And so they would drop, we, we hit out laundry bags to everybody in the campground when they checked in. Um, when their laundry bags were full, they brought them over to, uh, we called it the laundry pit stop. We would do the laundry. We'd find out where their spot is and we would return it to them the next day. <laughs> um, so I really learned there was no idea too crazy for people to take on. It was really just a matter of what the lawyers would let us do sometimes. Kind of a surprise because, I, you know, you don't think that these big sporting companies, sports franchises would be open to that kind of wild creativity. I, I kind of had the impression that they'd be like, this is what you get, you know, you'll like it or, or you'll buy it or not. What, what we found is, was, was that if it was um, a creative way to extend their brand to their audience, the sports teams were almost always on board with it. Um, you know, they're in the relationship business too. They're looking to build long-term customers. Um, and where you can take uh, and sync the brand uh, that we're promoting along with the sports team or the event there, there's a lot of power in that. And so it's not just a matter of spin the wheel, get a free prize, but where we could really add value um, and where we, we could really, you know, for, for Banana Boat, um, giving out sunscreen samples at a, at a race where people are out in the sun for eight hours at a time sitting in the grandstands, that's a huge added benefit to people that they don't have to go buy it now. And so it bec they become then more likely to purchase in the future. And, and we were able to demonstrate that time after time um, in the sports world. Uh, it was really something that I took away. It was one of my, my favorite things. I, I'd never done a lot of experiential marketing. My background was always in brand marketing and uh, direct response marketing. Getting to the experiential stuff was really interesting because it, it, it pushed another muscle in my brain. And there are still things from that experience that I take to my B2B clients now. You know, I learned no matter what idea we could come up with, the longest line was always to spin the wheel. People loved spinning the wheel and knowing they were going to win a prize. Didn't matter what you were giving away. <laughs> and now I have clients, now we do trade shows and I'm like, we need a wheel. We're going to do a wheel. And they look at me like, are you crazy? No. People will want to spin the wheel. They will want to win a prize. And sure enough, they do. That's great. Um, what is your creative process like? You know, the a client comes to you and it's a fabric softener or something like that. How do yeah. you come up with something that's interesting and different and going to be fun for people other than, of course, big spinning wheel? <laughs> so I, I always start, and it's still a skill that I use today. One, one of my regrets of what I do now as a, as a CMO, um, I don't get to spend as much time on the creative side of the world as I, as I used to, um, because that what, what I learned was that was just something I really loved about marketing. And what I love about the creativity is I try to put myself in the mind of my target audience. What's my audience want? What do they need? What are they looking for? Who's who's the hero in their story? Who's the villain in the story? How do, how do we overcome that? Um, there's there's a book called Story Brand uh, by Donald Miller that I always recommend to people um, that was introduced to me as a way to start thinking through the story. What are we trying to do? And I find that when I think about the audience that I'm trying to reach, that's where the creativity comes from. What can we put in their hands? What can we tell them? How do we convince them? Uh, that they need what we're selling or what we're offering or what we're providing. And I think the most creative ideas, you know, when somebody comes to you and says, look, how do we promote fabric softener and laundry detergent? The easy thing is to give out free samples. The fun thing is to say, well, what if we did the laundry for them? Um, oh, we can, we, we want to, we want to promote grocery. Well, what if we did a food truck? What if we actually brought these grocery products to the customer? Um, and once you sort of tap into that, then what do these food trucks look like? How do we make them really cool? Um, what do we do with, what do we do with ancillary elements? How do we get the race team involved? Well, what if, what if we did a, a, a makeover, a home makeover, and we used all target stuff to make over somebody's campground? Um, they're all things that really come by looking at who's the audience and what do they need? And then what do we have to sell and how do we make that a unique experience? If you can, if you can create something memorable, um, people will buy what you're selling them. And I think that that applies across the board. Mm. 
So it sounds like this was a very different experience from your first go around interaction with sports and yeah. you, it lasted longer for sure. So what, what, how, how do you think that you were able to combine that passion and interest in sports and business and have it be something that was more sustainable this time around? Um, I think it was because of, because of the variety. I think there were, there were a couple of challenges. You know, there is the creative challenge. Uh, at that point, I sort of understood advertising and marketing, knew what I brought to the table. Um, and unlike being a reporter where you're in the press box and, um, you know, your job is to tell people what happened at the game, being on the marketing side, it's a little bit different. So when I would go to games, it's a lot more entertainment. Um, I'm, I'm uh, in the box schmoozing clients. I'm working with my partners. I'm coming up with creative ideas. Um, what you don't realize is there's still just as much travel. There's still just as many late nights. Um, the, the challenges of working in sports um, are significant. There, there are things where, you know, I'd go to a hockey game in a suit um, because I'd be meeting with clients and that's what they wore to the hockey game. Um, baseball teams tend to be a little bit more uh, flexible. They, they tend to be a little bit more polos and khakis. Um, but even going to football games, I mean, these NFL executives, they wear suits at the game. So we would wear suits at the games. Uh, sometimes that gets a little bit old. But yeah. I, I do think that that understanding, I did a much better job of mixing my passion with my profession that second time around, mostly because I was a little bit more established in my profession and I was able to do the things that I like to do. At the same time, um, after about five years of doing it, the excitement starts to fade. Um, the the uh, the first time you're at, you're at a pit for a NASCAR race, it's awesome. The tenth time you're going, all right, how soon till this race ends? Because it's hot out here and it's loud, and I'm sick of being in the room. And that's when you really start to understand the difference between, you know, I have friends who have careers in sports. Um, you know, I dabble in sports, uh, and there are definitely pieces of it where you've really got to be all in on what you do and really love every aspect of it to make it your career. Um, because sometimes, you know, the being away from my family for three weeks, uh, doing an event at a, at a NASCAR track while while it's exciting and interesting and engaging, I'm still away from my family for three weeks. And those were the parts of the job that ultimately became, hey, I got to go find something else to do again. Yeah. And what drew you then to fractional CMO work? And, and for those who don't know what that is, what does that mean exactly? What, what is functionally, what do you do? Yeah. So what I do now is I work with companies that are too small to have a full-time chief marketing officer or sometimes too smart to have a full-time chief marketing officer. And I go in and I do the role of that job. So it's a lot of planning strategy. It's managing a team. Sometimes it's building a marketing team. Uh, and it's really sort of aligning marketing within the context of the entire business model, um, which is something because I've owned my own businesses, I understand how all of these pieces fit together. And what I learned over time was that what I really love to do is marketing. What happens when you start a business, um, and I'm sure you can relate to this, John, in some ways, is that all of a sudden you start to have employees and you start to have payroll and you start to have HR and you start to have, um, you know, process and you have to put the thing up in the break room on the wall. And if it's not there, you're going to get in trouble by uh, by OSHA and and you get, you know, vacation requests and, and all of these things that go into running a business that aren't why you got into that business in the first place. Um, most people that I know that this, this particularly, I have a lot of clients that are home improvement companies. And most of these home improvement companies, somebody's a plumber. They decide they can do plumbing on their own. They go start a plumbing business and they've got the plumbing part of it done, but it's the business part they have to learn from scratch. Um, and what I learned uh, was that running a business is fun. It's interesting, but it's tiring and it's not really what I loved. Um, and it all came to a head. Frankly, it was the, uh, I'll, I'll never forget. It was the NFL Hall of Fame enshrinement ceremony. We had been working with the Pro Football Hall of Fame for uh, probably about five or six years at that point. We did all of the marketing around all of their enshrinement ceremonies. That year, Jonathan Ogden was enshrined from the Baltimore Ravens. My business partner was there on site working with Jonathan. I was back running the office and I saw him on TV, my business partner, um, you know, congratulating people as they're walking to the stage to get their award and just basking in it. And I realized at the time, I don't love what we're doing that much. He does. Maybe I need to go find what I love. And what I love is marketing. I love sort of looking at it at a marketing challenge and trying by the to way, figure out. By the way, Big O, massive. I knew him a little, I met oh. him a little bit when he was at UCLA because I uh, had yes. friends there. 
just the biggest guy in the world. <laughs> a, a very, very large, and, and, and it's and it's funny. He is he is the nicest athlete. Um, you know, I've had, I've had, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of athletes. Yeah. Um, and I always tell people like, you know, they're people just like the rest of us. J.O. was one of the nicest guys I had ever met, um, yeah. willing to do anything for anybody at any time. I mean, we would have to pull him away from autograph signings because he'd stay there all day long. Yeah. Um, and it was great. And it was, and it was wonderful. Like when, when you work with a guy like that and you get to watch him get a personal accomplishment, like making the hall of fame. I mean, it's really neat. It's really yeah. a, a fun thing to do. Um, you know, Brian Dawkins was a partner of ours. Troy Vincent was a partner of ours. Um, and when I watch, you know, Brian got into the hall of fame, Troy's now working at the NFL. Um, uh, it's really sort of interesting watching these guys um, and getting to know them as people and then appreciating their accomplishments. I get excited every time I see the NFL draft and Troy Vincent's on stage reading draft picks. I'm like, oh, I know him. This is exciting. But at the same um, time, you saw what Jonathan was doing and you concluded, I, I don't love this like he does what he's doing. I was, yeah, I was ready to get out of the world of sports. Uh, and, and what I really love is, is marketing. You know, I really... Um, I enjoy the challenge of trying to figure out, here's what a business is looking to accomplish. Um, who is their audience? How do they think? How do we make ourselves relevant to them? And how do we come across as different than our competition? Um, there's so many people out there now selling the same things. How do you make yourself look unique, feel unique, even if at the end of the day, there's nothing that you're offering that is significantly different than anybody else? Um, you know, one of my clients now is a law firm. A law firm's a law firm, you know, assuming that they, they've got the right uh, background to handle your problems. Like, what's the difference? The difference is the people. Um, the difference is the approach. The difference is the way that we tackle things. Um, and so defining that brand and making yourself stand out, like these are really interesting challenges for me to take on. Whereas, you know, making payroll is a separate challenge. It's a different challenge. It's not quite as interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I, I shudder to think of what HR people have been dealing with the, the last 18 months. Um, like these are things where I'm happy to consult, I'm happy to advise, but to have to get into the weeds on those things, it wasn't what I wanted to do anymore. And it took me a while to figure out what does um, a fractional CMO look like? What, what does this role require? Um, when I started doing it, I was more or less a freelance ad agency. People would hire me to come do a project. I'd get a crew together. Um, you know, it, it took me a while to sort of figure out, you know, somebody would say, hey, can you build an app for us? Well, I don't build apps, but I can hire somebody to build an app and I can advise you on how to do it and I can project manage it. I guess that's what I do. Um, and it took a while to sort of figure out where my value was. I, I imagine uh, it's hard if you've worked in different roles in the marketing ecosystem to now say, I'm not in this role anymore. We're not an agency. We're not doing it for you. We're overseeing it, but we're not going to step into that role. So you kind of have to define boundaries. Correct. Correct. And, and, and I had never been a chief marketing officer before. So my experience had been uh, almost entirely on the agency side. I spent about six months at Microsoft um, back uh, before the year, two, around the year 2000. And, uh, and that was it. Everything else I'd done was always on the agency side. So now trying to figure out how do I embed myself with clients? Um, what do I need to know as a chief marketing officer? And then realizing it's not that different. And in fact, what, what being on the inside gave me the ability to do was to understand operations, understand the finance side, understand the sales side, um, suggest things that actually made the marketing better because I could affect process internally in a way that you can't when you're the ad agency. You know, as the ad agency, someone's coming to you and saying, I need a campaign around this. And if I say, well, you know, it actually would be better if you could get your salespeople to do X, Y, and Z, that's not my job. My job is to execute a campaign and hope it works. So I really enjoyed the challenges. As I started to get in and work with these companies, it really started to let me see, here's where the need is. The need is to have somebody that understands marketing at a, at a senior level, that can bring the value that a full-time chief marketing officer would bring to the table, but isn't going to cost these companies $250,000 a year for a full-time CMO. Um, they could pay a fraction of that um, by getting a portion of my time. And by doing that, um, what I realized quickly was I could use a portion of my time direct, directed the correct way, and they could get all the value that they got out of a full-time role for, for a part-time employee. Um, and I found that that model that I probably started the first couple of years, 2014, I started JK squared, um, which is my, uh, my fractional CMO firm. 
And uh, the first probably three years, four years, it was really sort of finding our way. But in, since about 2018, really realizing this chief marketing officer, this fractional, this outsourced role, um, there was a need for it. Um, there was a way to do it. And, and frankly, that learning that I was good at it. Um, and all the things that made me good on the ad agency side made me even better in this role, the ability to juggle, the ability to listen to different perspectives, the, the ability to lead by building consensus. Those were all things I learned at an ad agency uh, and, uh, and, and translated really directly into what I do now. Yeah. All right, Jeff, last question. So I call this my gratitude question. So if you look around at your peers and contemporaries, however you want to define that, who out there do you respect and admire? Who do you respect and admire people who are doing good work? So I, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, and hopefully he will thank me for it. Um, my friend Harley Magnet. Um, Harley and his brother Aaron started a little company about uh, 10 years ago now, maybe 11 years ago now, called Window Nation. And for those of you who don't know, Window Nation is a window replacement company. Um, they are now, I think, the fifth or sixth largest home improvement company in the country. Um, when I met Harley, he was a neighbor of mine. Um, he, was, he was trying to negotiate a deal with the Baltimore Ravens that we ended up never doing. Um, and he had a small window company. He grew up in the window business, but he had a small company that was in Cleveland. It was in Baltimore. It was in Washington. That was it. And um, they were probably doing uh, 2 to $3 million in sales. And when I first started doing, when, when I left at, at Aquarius, I tried to negotiate the sports deal for them. It didn't end up going through. When I left Aquarius, I said to Harley, hey, if you need any help, you know, keep me in mind. And about a year later, he called me and said, I've got this marketing department. I don't know what I'm doing with it. Can you help me? And um, I sat down and, and I talked to him and I talked to his brother, Aaron, and we rebuilt his marketing department. Um, we added another market. Um, after about a year and a half of me serving as their fractional CMO, we hired a full-time CMO. They kept growing. They kept growing. Um, they took on a private equity partner not too long ago. They've now built to probably about $250 million in revenue. Wow. They've got offices in about 16 different states. Are you still things that, are you still in the mix here, or you, I'm still in the mix. Okay. Uh, in fact, my my uh, my younger brother is one of their is their uh, director of marketing. Uh, they mm -hmm. still call me up for project work. I do videos for them from time to time. I get involved when they do new market expansions. Um, but Harley's always been great to me because Harley will always tell people in the home improvement industry, which, uh, as you may know, is is booming right now. Um, it's been one of the uh, COVID's been a good thing for that industry. Yeah, and definitely. People are spending more time at home and they're seeing things to be done and they have discretionary income that they're not using in other things. So as the market's grown, Harley always sort of looks around to other his peers in the industry um, and has always been willing to recommend me, um, has always been very supportive of the work that I do, has always been someone I can turn to. Um, you know, there are, there are times when uh, as an independent contractor, you have ebbs and flows in your business. And I know Harley's someone I can always turn to if I need a project. He's always got something there for me. Um, but he's also become a good friend and, and a mentor, frankly, um, in, in a lot of the marketing work that I do. And I, and I look at the way they built the business. Um, as successful as those guys are, they've never stopped. Uh, and they, they, they're constantly looking for ways to grow. They're constantly challenging themselves. Um, you know, there's, there's no need for either of them to sit foot in an office ever. Um, yet, you know, this was part of the deal was they didn't want to step away from the business. Even when they brought in outside partners, they wanted to make sure they had the control and that they were the ones doing, um, driving the growth of the business. They had a good plan. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, um, they've, they've since diversified into some other businesses. So they opened up a, a deli nearby, um, named after their father and their grandfather. Not uh, sure if that's really them, diversification for the three hundred million dollar uh, company buys a right? deli. <laughs> they open up a deli, uh, but look, I, I've got, there's no doubt we, we they they got me involved to do um, the logo development and to help them sort of with the branding of the deli. There's no doubt in my mind there's going to be a chain of Mikey and Mel's delicatessens up and down the East Coast sometime in the next four or five years, because um, yeah. that's how these guys think. It's like every nothing if if it's good, it's worth doing. It's worth doing right, um, and it's worth investing what it takes to do you know i think everybody's out there oftentimes looking for shortcuts um looking for ways to you know do more with less um and sometimes you need more to do more um and these guys are never afraid of doing it and i think it's a, it's been a good lesson for me as i've grown my business um the value of relationships um, the value of being willing to invest bet on yourself um and then put in the hard work that it takes to get there because nothing's uh, nothing's ever easy um and it just looks that way from the outside
Jeff, this has been great. Where can people go to learn more about you and JK Squared? So I've got a website. It's jk-squared.com. Um, they can also email me, jeff at jk-squared.com. Um, we've got a YouTube page. Uh, we've got, I've got a LinkedIn profile, but uh, you know, I'm always, I'm always uh, interested in new challenges um, and I'm always looking for, for new things to take on. So uh, my website's the best way to sort of get an introduction and, and shoot me a note. I'd love to talk to people. All right, Jeff. Thanks so much. John, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.